Hello, my name is Yoji Shimizu, Associate Dean of Graduate Education and Director of the Graduate School Diversity Office. With this video, I am proud to share with you the voices and viewpoints of some of our graduate students and postdoctoral trainees. The purpose of this project is to encourage the University of Minnesota community, students, faculty, and staff to engage in authentic and sometimes difficult discussions about diversity on our campus. How do we define diversity? Why are we investing in diversifying our graduate student and postdoctoral populations? What does it mean to genuinely value difference? The voices in this video reflect some of the most pressing issues currently experienced by our graduate students and postdocs as they navigate the University of Minnesota. They represent many forms of diversity, including racial and ethnic identity, disability, gender, sexual orientation, as well as the intersectionality of identities. After watching this video, I encourage you to take time to reflect on and discuss the culture and practices within your college, department, or program. But talking about how to create a more inclusive environment for all graduate students and postdocs is only the first step. Don't stop at the discussion. In whatever way is most appropriate for you and your colleagues, do something. Take part in formal training to incorporate best practices, to ensure a welcoming climate, and to address implicit bias. Create a plan for identifying the hidden rules that dictate behavior in your department and program. Encourage students, postdocs, and faculty to utilize the resources from the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity. Get engaged because we demonstrate what we value most by our actions, not just by our words. Adapting to U.S. graduate education and campus life is a challenging experience for international graduate students because it may conflict with their previous learning environments and in personal learning experiences. Education systems are established based on the cultural expectations of the people in each nation influenced by history, identities, languages, and values. It is important to inform international graduate students about the differences among education systems to ensure their success. It is even more important for faculty, staff, and students to understand the learning experiences of international graduate students. For example, in some Asian countries, students have been trained to be passive and sit quietly in lecture-type classes. Sharing independent thought is not expected, and students are likely to speak only by invitation in classes. Asking questions during lecture is considered impolite and insulting. From my own teaching experience and observation, some international students regard active participation as disrespectful and offensive, and it may lead to a loss of face in front of their peers. Memorizing is highly encouraged and students are not comfortable with open-ended class discussions. Also, duplicating other people's ideas without citation is not considered unethical because it is believed that knowledge does not belong to the individual. Students are encouraged to replicate works of their predecessors to demonstrate knowledge. This practice directly conflict with U.S. academic culture, causing confusion for both faculty and students, resulting in a premature termination of graduate program. While faculty know the power dynamic between students and teachers can be a barrier to student participation, they may not recognize the additional barriers to full participation that's faced by students from marginalized identities. Sensitive, savvy professors take proactive, intentional steps 
to reduce those barriers. They also set the tone for inclusivity in their classrooms, both by making space for less dominant voices and by calling out classroom contributions that intentionally or unintentionally crowd out the minoritized voices. Less culturally savvy professors can not only overlook opportunities to make their classroom more inclusive, they may inadvertently raise barriers and make participation even less likely. It would be great if the university provided training to all professors on techniques that they can employ to create a more inclusive classroom environment. Thoughtful professors can make a practice of stating why they value classroom participation. It's not only because participation is a component of how student performance is evaluated, but because of the potential value of each student's contribution to the edification of the class. The best professors can make it clear that a variety of opinions, even opinions that are different from their own, are welcome. And they back up such statements with consistent behaviors. Such behaviors can include being aware of how their comments and reactions, as well as nonverbal signals, such as facial expressions, can indicate either appreciation or rejection of various perspectives. To create a more inclusive environment, another demographic of a cohort of graduate students coming in. If the faculty and staff know a DACA recipient is joining the program, then providing some information will make it feel more inclusive as it will remove some of the foreboding of one having to explain our circumstances to potential advisors and how it impacts our personal lives and career options. Not knowing if my work authorization will be able to be renewed every two years is what is most pressing on my mind about being a DACA undocumented graduate student. If I do not have valid work authorization, I don't know how I can remain in graduate school as I would have no means of earning a living through teaching and research appointments. I despise feeling like everything is tied to my work authorization being valid for me to continue doing that which I love. Growing up as an undocumented student, there was always uncertainty regarding if I would make it to the next step. The source for the uncertainty of my future was never about my motivation or determination, but rather the opportunities available. As a first generation high school, college, and now graduate student, I feel extremely fortunate to momentarily say that I made it. My journey as a graduate student at the University of Minnesota has been transformative. The academic and intellectual rigor of graduate school have pushed the limits of what I thought I could accomplish. My growth as a person and intellectual would not be possible without the unyielding support and high expectations of my department, advisors, and graduate faculty. At present, I fear that my family will be separated or that I will be unable to continue my graduate studies. This is an emotional and psychological burden that I cannot escape. My hope is that undocumented students will be given the opportunity to pursue their dreams. Thank you for including their voices. My PhD mentor routinely engaged in sexually inappropriate behavior, acting out oral sex, masturbation, humping lab equipment, and telling stories of his own sex life. When I went to my DGS, I was informed that as a student, I had no rights. My advisor was free to take me in his office, close the door, and do whatever he wanted, and I couldn't say a word. The department had told me I was just being too sensitive. And a dean told me that this was a boys' club and I needed to learn to play by the boys' rules. Women in science are disproportionately more likely than men to be interrupted, talked over, addressed with a condescending tone, or addressed without their professional title being acknowledged. Additionally, 
we are often not credited for our ideas. For example, in a meeting, I suggested an experiment and my idea was immediately dismissed by the presenter. Minutes later, a male colleague made the same suggestion, only this time the idea was welcomed by everyone in the room. This and other types of microaggressions often stem from unconscious gender bias and contribute to women feeling like they need to constantly prove their worth, intellect, and abilities. And when we do, our successes are often attributed to luck, while the successes of our male colleagues are attributed to their abilities. On the flip side, our failures are often generalized to the group we represent. As a woman in science and as an international student, I feel pressured to perform extremely well so that others associate female scientists and students from my country as smart and successful. This pressure can be overwhelming at times, and I imagine it is amplified for students who feel even more marginalized. To bridge the gender gap in science and create an inclusive environment, we must be cognizant of our own biases and hold ourselves and others accountable. Listen, and if you witness microaggressions, step in. And most importantly, don't generalize our successes and errors to the groups of people with whom we identify. As an international graduate student, I encountered more cultural and educational challenges than originally expected, particularly with my whole support system thousands of miles away and 13 hours ahead of me. Struggling with anxiety and depression, I was afraid to reveal my secret and reluctant to seek help because of the stigma attached to mental health in my own culture. My ongoing healing journey led me to realize how crucial it is for faculty to be aware and create a safe and supportive environment for us to normalize and voice our mental health struggles, as well as practice self-care. As a graduate student whose education was obtained outside the United States, I am used to writing in a direct, simplified manner where points that are expected to be understood do not need to be stated. In the US academic culture, students are expected to provide more context. I need clear guidelines of writing expectations to maintain a good grade. This obstacle is a setback to my progress since I can communicate what I know, but it may not translate to the reader. The result is a snowball effect of low grades that adversely affect my mental health. The UMN community needs to understand that not all graduate students can turn to their families or parents for financial support. Some of us come from poverty to graduate school. I was, for a very long time, the most financially stable person in my family. Being a graduate student, making the income of a TA or an instructor, an income that borders on the poverty line, still put me in a better position than my family financially which goes to demonstrate how unstable my family's income was at the time of my admission. When I started graduate school, I could not turn to my parents or family members for support if my student loans did not arrive on time, if an unforeseeable expense came up, or if I was in a bind to pay my student fees. I am the person my family usually calls when someone needs to borrow money. That's a very difficult position to be in, to have to survive off our income or fellowships and also provide for our families when they need us. I urge professors and staff not to dismiss students' concerns when our stipends, pay, or fellowship do not arrive on time. I also question if people understand how burdensome the upfront costs we're expected to shoulder, such as student fees or long periods without funds during summer break can be for students who are living on a very limited income without support. I come from a family that has taught me that any work is dignified work and have therefore done what I needed to do to stay in graduate school, 
working jobs as a dishwasher, as a house cleaner, and as a nanny during summer and winter break. I'm proud of my journey, but I hope people understand why some of us do not have the privilege of traveling for research during summer or writing an article over summer break without a significant fellowship. If you want to prioritize income diversity alongside racial and ethnic diversity, these issues must also be at the center of how we are supported. There are definitely extra hurdles that minority students have to jump through to get and to stay here. Because of lack of peers with shared identities, as you pursue higher levels of education, it becomes a very isolating and lonely time. These students sometimes experience cycles of what is known as the imposter syndrome. Do I belong here? Am I good enough? These experiences of loneliness take emotional toll on students' performance and interferes with their studies and work. As a university, we should work towards diversifying graduate education by providing a more inclusive atmosphere to lessen the burden on current diverse students. Diversity should be an important facet where people strive to foster an atmosphere of mutual respect and celebrate the differences that make each of us unique. While many white graduate students aim to thrive during their journey here at the University of Minnesota, being an undocumented, queer, Muslim, and a person of color, I aim to survive. And every step in turn, the system tries to bring me down and set me up for failure. I don't exist. Neither do my experiences matter in white spaces unless they need my brown face, thick accent, and all of my marginalized identities to showcase their diversity. As a queer graduate student of color and organizer, I have to contend with the daily oppressions of being me. I am asked to be the spokesperson of the multiply oppressed student on various levels. For example, last year, the college student Republicans painted a small build-a-wall mural on the campus bridge connecting the west and east side of campus. The anti-immigrant, racist, and xenophobic rhetoric popularized by the current U.S. president. So every week, I had to walk by this mural. I had to be reminded that people like my mother and father were not wanted here. That was dehumanizing. Even though they have worked hard picking crops most of their lives, they were consistently rejected in this country. As a scholar, I felt the need to write about the current conditions that undocumented and mixed immigrant status families face. As a graduate instructor, I had to educate my students about this country's long xenophobic past. I felt an obligation to confront and find resources for my students being impacted by the political environment. As a student organizer, I found it absolutely necessary to make visible the problem, so I organized student walkouts and protests, all while the university administration defended the mural as free speech. This was multiply taxing on the mind and body, and yet we are asked to accept this hate and be calm. If the university or any university values the presence of students of color on campus, they must do the critical work to address the ways we continue to experience racism, xenophobia, or any other type of hatred on campus. All political, social, and economic university policies must reflect and be guided by these voices in non-superficial and tokenizing ways.
Most postdoctoral associates are at an age where they are beginning to start families. This can be made difficult by restrictions the university places on postdocs. Postdocs are not eligible for retirement benefits, despite being a prime age to start contributions. If a postdoc receives an external fellowship, which should be encouraged by a university with a strong research initiative, the job code of the postdoc is changed. In the past, that has meant revocation of parking and bus pass privileges, and still means that health care benefits are removed, taxes are not withheld from paycheck, and no W-2 is generated. Although graduate health care is provided, it is not ideal for individuals with dependents because of the high cost. Lack of a W-2 can make applying for loans, particularly mortgages, difficult or impossible. Asking postdocs who are mostly in their 30s to continue to put off family life until after training is unfair and biologically impractical. These restrictions limit the pool of postdocs willing to come to the University of Minnesota and ultimately limit our contributions to the advancement of science. Hi, I'm Kate. I'm a PhD candidate in the History of Science, Technology and Medicine program. I thought it was important for you to see me and hear my computer voice, as I have been told I tend to shatter stereotypes. I see disability as another form of diversity, much like gender, sexual orientation and race. I have a vast array of strengths and skills. I have presented at numerous conferences, have a book chapter and two book reviews published, and have lectured several classes. It has taken a cohort of myself, the faculty and my advisors, creatively working together for me to get to this point. Which brings me to my most important point, that accommodations are necessary, but not sufficient. What accommodations do? is try to level the playing field in the able-bodied world. However, that is not my world. I have a different set of life experiences, a different set of skills, a different way of viewing the world, and that has value, the same way that the people who are the traditional targets of diversity, have value. The problem is, that this is almost never acknowledged, so instead of adding value, only accommodations are provided. I think it's important to work collaboratively with the student with disabilities, to come up with things that meet both the needs and skills of the student, and the requirements of the graduate program, because students with disabilities have been creative about making things work for a long time. Hi. I'm Ryan Maximus. I'm a doctoral student in the College of Education and Human Development, a student senator, and the co-founder of the Organization for Graduate and Professional Students with Disabilities. I am a former Presidential Management Fellow and employee of the United States Federal Government. I also am a person with lifelong and significant physical disability. I have low vision. Like many people with disability, I have faced prejudice. I rely upon accommodation to enable me to participate fully and successfully in the classroom and office environment despite my vision. Accommodation does not provide unfair advantage to people with disabilities. Accommodation enables people with disability to participate fully and successfully in lifelong pursuits, on even playing with all individuals despite their disabilities. Universal design is a radical approach to accommodation, but does not obviate all accommodation needs. I have an invisible disability. Disability occurs in myriad forms, some visible, others not, all equally real. When a student confides in you their disability, believe them, even if their disability is not obvious to you. Do not presume to know more about a student's disability 
than does that student. It takes courage for a person with disability to confide such privileged information to a stranger. When a student informs you of their disability, respect that confidence. Intentionally failing to meet an accommodation need once established through student-professor interaction constitutes willful noncompliance and is a violation of university policy, federal law, and civil rights. Thank you for taking the time to view this video to learn about some of the experiences of our diverse graduate students and postdocs. The challenges and concerns that have been expressed are not unique to the University of Minnesota. Addressing them is a critical part of diversifying any institution of higher education. Achieving the university's academic mission requires that we attract, graduate, and train the most promising individuals from all segments of society. These diverse perspectives enhance our scholarship and research. As faculty and staff, you play a critical role in ensuring a supportive and inclusive environment where our students and postdoctoral researchers feel valued and affirmed as members of the university community. As you consider your role in creating a more inclusive campus climate, we have provided a list of resources you can use to help develop a plan to effectively communicate, advise, and mentor across differences. Please take advantage of the various units on campus committed to supporting faculty, staff, and students as we work towards developing a culture of diversity and inclusivity.